Justice, decolonizing knowledge, building power. My name, woo! My name. My name is Julia Chinure Opara, and I am the chair of the Ethnic Studies Department at Mills College. Go Mills! And I'm also co-chair of NAIS 2014. Halito. Good evening, my name is Andrew, son of Annetta and Kenneth, grandson of Gertie and Howard, and Isabella <clears throat> and Andrew, great-grandson of Eli, Allie, Francois, Rosina, Lilla, <clears throat> and Curtis. Uh, I introduce myself in this way, I come from the Opelousa and Atakapaw Ishak Nation uh, in southwest Louisiana. And um, we are very excited to have you here tonight. This event um, is possible in many ways because of all the awesome efforts of so many people, but it comes about this whole notion, the theme for NAIS uh, this year, the 42nd uh, conference, uh, research as ceremony, decolonizing ethnic studies. When we think about research as a ceremony, what does that ultimately mean? When we think of ethnic studies and the work that we do, as ceremony, what does that mean? And so the data center, um, Miho Kem, who can't be with us tonight, and I, I really want to um, honor and acknowledge her work and, 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 and wisdom and, and the whole entire data center staff uh, in contributing to a vision of research justice, that communities can unlock the power of their own knowledge for self-determination, that you all here today gathered with us, we are all the experts. You don't, we don't need the university experts alone to come, that we need to, re, we need to heal the broken um, hoop, the, the broken circle uh, between us. And so how do we bring, um, bring ourselves back? Um, in unity together as, as one community. And so that's what tonight is all about. Um, and we thank you all for being here. And so, as Andrew said, this event is part of the National Association for Ethnic Studies 42nd Annual Conference. And we're so proud and honored to partner with them. Um, NAIS 2014 is a unique and exciting partnership between the National Association for Ethnic Studies, the Mills College Ethnic Studies Department, Data Center, and San Francisco State University, with Andrew's affiliation. And so we really want to um, welcome you to come to Mills College tomorrow and spend the day with us um, to continue this conversation. We have been overwhelmed with the response to this uh, conference. Uh, we had over 450 people registered. We have had over 100 workshops, breakout sessions, um, cultural events, um, spiritual healing circles. It's been a really incredible ride so far and we have a whole nother day tomorrow. So please come and join us. As the planning committee for NACE 2014 came together, we wanted to be very intentional um, as we thought about this process for planning an academic conference that was unlike any other academic conference that we'd ever attended. We wanted to have an academic conference where actually the community were the experts. We wanted to have an academic conference where cultural work was absolutely at the center, where we recognized that we bring our whole selves, not just the intellect and the mind, but that mind has to be sustained by our bodies, by our spirits, and that the work that we do comes from our passion, from our lived experiences, and we bring all of that into the room. We wanted to have an event that was truly intergenerational. And some of you may have seen my daughter running around. We have ch had childcare. We've had the elders and the grandparents here speaking as well over these three days. Um, and we wanted to have an event that was really relational. So much of academia is um, isolating. People sit in their little pods and write papers on their own. And then they get their grades and they agonize over them on their own. And that has nothing to do with what ethnic studies was founded to do and has nothing to do with what we do today in ethnic studies. So we are in community. 
and we are attempting to build um, a movement around research justice, transforming the way in which research has been done, transforming it in a way that is relational, that builds community, that creates connections between us, and that lifts our spirits and our communities as a whole. And so please join us tomorrow um, for the continuation of this conversation, and I just uh, wish that you have a wonderful evening tonight, and thank you again for being here. Before I uh, introduce um, uh, Karina Gould and uh, Sisters of the Drum, I, I want to invite everyone to think about your ancestors and to the, the, the legacy that um, they've left and, and given to us, and then to also think about what legacy we want to leave. Um, a question I asked uh, some of my graduate students a few weeks back was uh, we were discussing is there a difference between holy land and sacred land. And when we think about a holy land or holy, a holy space, often that's about entitlement, it's about an inheritance, and when we think about a sacred space, it's about a responsibility, and it's also about our power to will something for those seven generations that will come after us. And so I invite everyone tonight as we create, a, that we create this sacred space together that we call in our ancestors, um, and that first and foremost too, as we begin tonight, that we thank and honor and, and, and um, really recognize the Ohlone people whose land that we are standing on and, have, and, and ask their permission and, 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 and be supportive, not just today when we invite uh, Ohlone leaders and community folks to come and, 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 and welcome us to, to Ohlone territory, but to always be um, doing what I call radical love, and that is that we, that we honor the, the commitments that we have to each other's communities and that we stand in solidarity and that that's not just a slogan, but that when um, no one else is talking about the issues um, except for uh, communities, for example, the Ohlone, that others will stand up um, together uh, and really um, mean what they say. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Karina Gould. Ohlone, born and raised in Oakland, California. She is the Title VII Coordinator and Manager of Daily um, <clears throat> Programming at the American Indian Child and Resource Center in Oakland. She is also the co-organizer co -organizer for the Indian People Organizing for Change, a small nonprofit that works on indigenous people's issues, as well as sponsoring an annual Shell Mound Peace Walk to bring about education and awareness of the desecration of sacred sites in the Greater Bay Area. Karina sits on the Native American Committee for the American Indian Friends Services Committee. <clears throat> uh, the Board of Directors for the Oakland Street Academy Foundation and spends much of her free time volunteering in the American Indian community. Uh, following Karina's welcome, Sisters of the Drum will join us. And Sisters of the Drum are students and teachers, listeners and communicators, consumers and creators, protectors and nurturers, friends and lovers. They drum from the heart, for the heart, to the heart, and with their heart. Absorbing the teachings of West African rhythms, songs, and dances, Sisters of the Drum respectfully represent the essence of their traditional African roots in harmony with their African American cultural <clears throat> rearing. The resulting sound is from somewhere deep within, playing through them and resonating with all of us. Current members are Elmar Stevens, Sandy Mills, Charlene Gums, Cynthia Lewis, Sean Neely, Latanya Carmichael, and Selena Gray. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. While I'm on this tedious journey, walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Hold my hand, Lord, hold my hand. Hold my hand, Lord, hold my hand. While I'm on this tedious journey, hold my hand, Lord, hold my hand. Wait in 
Can you sing with me? You heard it. You know what you know what it is, right? I didn't hear y'all. All right, that's what I want to know. If you know the song. All right. You can clap. That's nice. Come on. Here we go. Come on. Let's wait in the water. That's right. Come on. Wait in the water. Children, come on, wait in the water. Hey, God's gonna trouble the water. Say, and I went to the water, the water to pray. What? God's gonna trouble the water. It felt so good. I stayed all day. Yes, I did. Oh yeah, come on. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh yeah. Uh, that sounds really good. But I got a second part for you, okay? You guys all right with that? I can't hear you. I like that much better. Now all you have to say is in the water, all right? There is love in the water. Peace in the water. Joy in the water. Healing in the water. Everything you need in the water. Come on in the water. Let's jump in in the water. Jump in in the water. I said you need it in in the water that's right everything that you need yeah in the water everything that you want yeah it is in the water everything that you need come on in the water it is Black is healing, black is love, black is kind, blackness of the mind. Black is healing, black is love, black is kind, blackness of the mind. Cause I feel like funking it up, I feel like funking it up. I feel like funking it up, I feel like funking it up. I feel like funking it up, I feel like funking it up. I feel like funking it up, I feel like funking it up. Spirit is a guide, the drum is a voice. Seven black women making conscious choice. To drum from a heart, drum from a soul. Africa, the motherland is deep in the fold. Other drummers, Other drummers. may make your head bop, but we gon' make your heart and soul rock. Healing music uh, is what we all bring. Learning from the past is an African thing. Black pride, black pride. we wait word in the cells. Dread, lock, mud, clock, cow with shell. Yeah. See, I am the drum. I am the drum. Love the drum. Be the, drum. Be the drum. I am the drum. I am the drum. 
I feel like funking it up. 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 Little Sally Walker walking down the street. Y'all remember that? Little Sally Walker walking down the street. She said, put your hands on your hips. Make your backbone, make your backbone, make your backbone slip. Make your backbone, make your backbone, make your backbone slip. Now, now, shake it to the east. Now, shake it to the west. Come on. Now, shake it to the one that you love the best. Shake it to the one that you love the best. Cause I feel like funking it up. 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 Little Sally Walker walking down the street. Didn't know what to do, so she jumped in front of me. She said, Go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing, go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing. She said, Go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing, go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing. She said, Go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing, go on, girl, do your thing, do your thing. Stop! One, two, three. My mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakelambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakelambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakelambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakel. Come on, you guys can sing it. My mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kake lambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kake lambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kake lambe kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my. My mo, kake lambe kakum. Come on, sing. My mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kake lambe kakum be. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kake lambe kakum be.
my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakela me kakumbe, my mo, my mo, my mo, my my, my mo, kakela me kakumbe, my mo, my mo, my my. My mo, kakela me kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my. My mo, kakela me kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my my. My mo, kakela me kakumbe. My mo, my mo, my mo, my my. My mo, kakela me kakumbe. Thank you again. That was amazing. Give it up for Sisters of the Drum one more time. The ancestors are definitely in the room with us tonight. Um, so let's. Uh, so we're gonna have a sit down. Last year we had decolonizing knowledge, and I, and at the time we talked about sitting down like at the kitchen table to have a dialogue and just. Keep it real, like you did at your household when you were growing up, and that's how we do it in a lot of our communities. And so we're gonna have a sit down dialogue tonight, and we are gonna include, we want you because you are the experts too, so we'll be involving you, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a, in a minute in the discussion that we're gonna be having. But first, I'd like to uh, invite each one of uh, these wonderful people who are doing such amazing work in our communities to really, um, uh, create that ceremony that we've been talking about to work toward decolonization. So I'll invite each of them up one by one to take one of the red seats uh, up here on stage. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Colleen Sisk. Colleen Sisk is the spiritual leader and tribal chief of the Winnemum Wintu tribe <clears throat> who practice their traditional culture and ceremonies in their territory along the McLeod River uh, watershed in Northern California. Colleen is, the, uh, is an internationally known speaker on traditional tribal and spiritual issues, having spoken on diverse topics such as spiritual medicine ways, the spirit of water, and global warming, as well as sacred sites protection and the responsibility of tribal people to honor their tribal life way. Colleen is also a leading voice in raising awareness of the poor human rights conditions suffered by federally unrecognized tribes and unrepresented indigenous people around the world. Please join me in welcoming Colleen. The red one, yeah. Thank you. Jason Ferreira. Jason Ferreira is associate professor and director of race and resistance studies in the nation, excuse me, in the world's only college of ethnic studies at San Francisco State University. Before arriving at San Francisco State University, he was a University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellow. His teaching and scholarship focus on the history of radicalism within and across communities of color. He is currently working on a social history of the multiracial struggle that culminated in the 1968 and 69 Third World Strike, tentatively entitled, With an Undying Love for Our People that ultimately gave birth to the first Department of Black Studies and still 
the only College of Ethnic Studies in the nation. Please join me in welcoming Jason Pereira. And next, I'd like to introduce Angela Davis. Through her activism and scholarship over many decades, Angela Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice around the world. Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Angela Davis is a founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to dismantling the, to the dismantling of the prison industrial complex. Please join us in welcoming Angela Davis. Good evening. Um, thank you again um, for, all, for being here again. Uh, again, I'm Andrew Jolivet, uh, Associate Professor, I forgot to say that earlier, Associate Professor of American Indian Studies and Department Chair of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University, uh, and honored to be co-chair of this year's uh, conference with Julio Pera. Um, Tonight, uh, as I said, we really want to have an, a critically engaged scholar, um, excuse me, uh, dialogue and conversation, um, not just with the panelists here uh, on stage, um, but also with you, the audience. And so after each of the questions, uh, or at least the first two, I will actually, after the uh, folks here, after Colleen and Jason and, and Angela have had a chance to answer the question, I will turn to the audience and ask you to answer those questions with one another because um, as I said, I've said in the past and, and quoting um, elders that, you know, in terms of the native community, we don't need more um, Indian experts. We need more expert Indians. And I think that's true of all of our communities. Um, and so when we talk about what it means to, for ethnic studies to act as a decolonizing force, but also to be decolonized, it means that we honor the knowledge that's in this room, all of the knowledge that's in this room, because it's all of that knowledge that will, that will make um, that ceremonial process of healing um, possible. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question, and then uh, whoever wants to start addressing that, and then I will turn to you to answer this question as well. So <clears throat> the first question is, given the shifts in um, ethnic studies and in indigenous and people of color communities since the 1960s to the present, who do you believe owns ethnic studies? And owns is in quotes. And is there a difference in owning and being responsible stewards for ethnic studies? Right? Okay. <laughs> um, this sounds like it might be one of those trick questions. Uh, well, I, I've had the good fortune of of being able to sit down with many of the founders of ethnic studies um, at San Francisco State in particular. I've, sat, I've done maybe about almost 50 oral histories and, and, I've, and I've asked them a version of, the, of that question and sort of an assessment of what they think of how ethnic studies has evolved over the past 40 plus years and does it, is it consistent with some of the, the original visions and, and mission as they set out. Um, but it's a tricky question because it's, it's, it's in some ways like who owns the black freedom struggle? Who owns the Chicano movement? Um, it, it's, it's one of those types of questions and of course there are people who will have different answers for that. Um, I, I, tonight I, I, I take, uh, and I'm going to probably bring him up a couple of times this evening, take great inspiration from um, a great thinker and revolutionary uh, from Guinea Bissau named Amokar Cabral who said, uh, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. And so it's in that spirit that I'm gonna try to answer this question. Um, I think how you answer the, it's how you understand what is ethnic studies um, and where do you find it? Is it in Research One universities, the University of California, the Ivy Leagues, USC, places like that? Is it, it looks different if you're at a teaching institution, like in the CSU or in community colleges or in K through 12. And then there's also how does ethnic studies look like in the community itself? And that space rarely gets talked about as much as it as much as it should. Um, 
I think there's two types of ethnic studies. I think there is the ethnic studies that we see in the academy, um, and I think that um, largely that ethnic studies is understood to, I'm cheating, I have little notes here. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that ethnic studies is oftentimes understood to be a field, a career, an area of expertise, and I think in that area, in that regard, I think we've done, uh, we've been beleaguered, we're always living on the margins of the knowledge plantation, um, but over the last 40 plus years, I think we've made an impact. I mean, if you look at the books that have been published, if you look at the journal articles that have been produced, if you look at the conferences that are held, um, you know, just recently, and I won't try not to go into too long here, but recently I had the opportunity to participate in with the Ford Foundation, looking at some of the scholar, look at, um, uh, looking at some of the scholars that are that are coming up that are applying for these grants, and it's always nice to give out other people's money, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's truly amazing some of the scholarship that's that's being produced, and so it's. In terms of that ethnic studies, we're doing quite well. But just like the black freedom struggle, just like the Chicano movement, ultimately with ethnic studies, it's the people that own ethnic studies. It's the community that owns ethnic studies. Um, and that ethnic studies is, is different. Education is a part of it, but I think we need to think of ethnic studies differently as a broader political project of which ethnic studies Education, rather, is just one component, an important component, uh, but, but one component itself. Um, and these two interpretations oftentimes live in tension with one, with one another. And this is where I think the whole notion of um, uh, uh, decolonial methodology can, can, can move us in a direction where it goes, ethnic studies is truly held by um, the people. I think of it, I'll, I'll end with this, I want to end with a historical analogy on this quote. I, I often think of it like um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1964 organizing in Mississippi, organizing freedom schools, which is quite frankly some of the roots of what we think of as ethnic studies and the educational praxis and the pedagogies that were employed in Mississippi, being tied also to the registration of people to vote and challenge the Dixiecrats in Atlantic City um, as the MFDP and all of the organizing that went into it and the strength of that organizing um, to create a space, to broaden democracy, to deepen freedom um, was powerful, much like the movement for ethnic studies created a space that was powerful. Um, but as we all pro probably know, um, the institution wouldn't open. In fact, they said, here's two symbolic seats. And as Bob Moses says in the film, Freedom on My Mind, that was a major, major turning point because what the system said is we'll take these people, the professionals, right? The ones that will represent you but not the domestics, not the sharecroppers. There won't be power sharing. And I think that the real ethnic studies is tied to this idea of the community. Where are our working class people? Where are the folks in the neighborhoods, in the barrios, in the reservations? That's where ethnic studies is still struggling to open up to. And so, but that's who I think owns ethnic studies ultimately. Okay. <laughs> you want to hear from me? Okay, well, since the microphone was um, <laughs> offered to me. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Julia and Andrew for having invited me to um, participate in this, in this conference. I'm not officially associated with ethnic studies, but I can say that I did teach in the ethnic studies department, the School of Ethnic Studies, rather, at San Francisco State in the late, uh, from the late 1970s, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, to the early 1990s. Um, and so I think I would answer that question by First of all, um, looking at the concept of owning. Um, because I think that, you know, oftentimes we don't, we don't examine the concepts that we use to try to arrive at progressive uh, understandings and we end up 
you know, replicating. So for me, that concept already, you know, replicates a kind of capitalist relationship uh, uh, to the field. Um, and second of all, I think it is so important to recognize the contradictions. Um, um, when, when I taught in ethnic studies, and I'm going to be very honest this evening, um, <laughs> it was at that time a major struggle to address issues of gender and sexuality. And before I was able to teach one course on, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was about black women. Uh, before I was able to teach one course, I, I think design five or six. So what I'm saying is that those problematic moments are also a part of the history, a part of the genealogy. And, and if, we don't, if we don't recognize them, uh, then uh, we might not be building the, the institutions, uh, the, prax the practices, the theories we think we are. But I wanted to uh, inject here that I remember when I first began teaching in ethnic studies in um, the late 70s, uh, there was still very much the historical memory alive uh, uh, regarding the fact that that was not the name that those who struggled for that institution wanted uh, uh, to, to, to use to mark the work that was being done. It was third world uh, studies. So I think it's also important to look at moments of promise. Promises, you know, promises are never completely fulfilled. Um, and the promise of, of ethnic studies was inevitably not fulfilled. But I think we can look back and see uh, and, and try to understand what this notion of third world studies, the work that it um, might have done, what might this feel have looked like if we had retained that name? Thinking about the politics of naming. Uh, uh, how much less United States centric might it have been? How much, you know, might the by studies with respect to Cuba or Vietnam or Palestine might, and I know this is happening in ethnic studies, uh, but, but there's also been a struggle, right, to bring these, the, these issues into the frame. So th that's what I have to say. <laughs> You know, I'm not a professor, and I uh, really haven't taken ethnic studies classes. I did attend a college to graduate, but uh, ethnic studies was outside the realm of Indian people or tribal people. Uh, it's totally still excluded in, in that studies. And when I was going to school at college at Chico State, I always thought ethnic studies was like about women. You know, feminism, uh, women who didn't want to be labeled in, in other ways, but was making a name for women. And, uh, and I think about ethnic studies now, it's like tribal people could have an ethnic studies because we are totally different. You know, people think we're all the same, but we're not. Here in California, there's over 135 different dialects of language. And we're from the desert, we're from the mountains, we're from the ocean, we're from the rivers. We're from the fish, we're from, you know, every different thing you can think of. Yet, uh, when I would look at ethnic studies, there wasn't the, the titles um, that would, would lend itself to say, I should take that class. You know, that would, that would be something about me. 
about my people, about my history, about uh, the tribal situation that we came from and where we're going to. But uh, for us, or at least in, in my community and, and the students that I went to school with, um, it wasn't that open door. It wasn't the, the thing that um, could help us. You know, we, uh, we were a very, we're, and we still are, a very small population on any of the campuses. Uh, we don't have very many students there. We have barely any professors on any of the campuses that are American Indian in general. But I look across and I've recently asked the question, it's like, how many California Indian professors do we have on these campuses? Mm -hmm. You know, they're teaching about California Indian history, they're teaching about all these things, but they have no roots here or understanding of how um, the ethnicities of this tribal group and area really actually unfolded to this day and age and what we gave up for the existence of other people coming in and making a place while we have no place, while we have to sit aside and uh, be unheard and un unthought of in these processes. You know, when, we're, when you're designing those classes of ethnic studies, how many times do you talk about uh, what unit are you gonna bring in for the Indian people? How are you gonna address the issues of the Indian women and the losses that they have incurred? You know, we're talking about seven generations. Well, I am a result of seven generations before me and there'll be seven generations after me. But somewhere in these schools, in these academic settings, you know, things must change to include us too. We're not visitors here to this country. We didn't choose to come to this country but we should have a space uh, that allows us to grow and meet the needs that we have to maintain our ethnicity, our traditions, our songs, our way of living, you know, and, and not have to join, you know, get on the train that everybody seemed to come here to be on, that you, we're, not, we're not engaged in that, you know, and I just, um, I just want to say that um, Angela Davis was a big name, right, in the 60s. And I was a kid in, in uh, I think I was probably in eighth grade or something, and Angela Davis's story was like hitting, hitting everywhere, even in our English class, you know, about what she was doing and what people were accusing her of and what she was standing for. And it's like, uh, we're looking at it as Indian people, you know, mm -hmm. that finally somebody of color <laughs> is sort of making a change where people have to think about what does that mean? You know, that's an ethnic study to me when it opens that door. Thank you, all of you. And uh, Jason, you're right, it was a trick question. <laughs> I, I, I use the word own uh, deliberately in many ways to really think about, because I'm going to turn to you now, is just that um, when we think about own, right, um, there's been a lot of changes. And I think starting with the fact that the name isn't the same, where, who is running ethnic studies when we have programs being cut left and right in the CSU since the election of President Obama. It's not a coincidence, right, when we elect a person of color, regardless of, you know, what he's doing or not doing, but as soon as that election happened, every conservative thing that people could think of, because there's that fear, right, everything's shifting, everything's changing, all from Arizona to Texas to basically all over the country, and so who's controlling and, and, and running uh, that show. So I want to actually give just uh, three minutes or so to ask you to just turn to the person you're sitting next to and answer that same question. Who do you think owns ethnic studies or who does it belong to? Um, and maybe now that I've said it was a trick question, how do we reclaim, right? How do we actually reclaim ethnic studies, right? All right, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, yeah, someone has a question. We said we were doing it community style. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Hi. Oh, my God. Um, I thought that we were... Oh, do I have to? Oh, my God. Hi. I'm Makita Mack. 
I'm a freshman at SF State and I'm awesome, I guess. Okay. I thought that you were going to call on us to answer the question of owning and you didn't. So I was like, uh, so I was just going to give my microphone to her because she's going to answer. Oh my God. Go ahead. Answer. Yes. Go for it. When you mean, when you say like reclaiming ethnic studies, go deeper, I guess. Like, oh, that's your question. No, not, I don't know. I didn't have a question. It was just a statement. I didn't expect you to read the microphone. And so I forgot. <laughs> I actually would like to answer I, that question. Oh, this oh, is originally what yeah. we were going to do, so I'm glad I, it happened. Somebody wants to happen. answer the question. I want to answer that. Oh, and then I would like to, yeah. Hi, my name is Eileen Tejada. I teach English composition and literature at Napa Valley College. Um, however, I fly under the radar because I bring in all of the things, all of the issues um, into my classroom. And I fly under, I've been flying under the radar for about 24 years. <laughs> <clears throat> What I want to say about ethnic studies is um, I believe that white institutions own ethnic studies. And that the, what, what, I, what I see and what I've seen is that the money, it's uh, funding dependent, and so the discourse is extremely controlled. We as professors are very much at risk, if, particularly if we don't have um, tenure. And if we're trying to get tenure, there is a discourse that we are not allowed to participate at risk for our very livelihood. So I think that reclaiming it means that we need to understand how um, the inst educational institutions, academia work. And that we also need to come together as professors of color across institutions and get real about how we're being treated. Because we are being treated like ethnic studies is treated. We are mistreated all the time. And we, we need, uh, I think, to come together and address the needs of our students of color in very broad way, particularly both the men who I see are coming more damaged um, and the women who are bearing more and more of the responsibilities for surviving. So thank you. Um, I think, hi, I'm Shanna. I'm a senior at Mills College. Um, um, I, I just want to say really fast when we talk about um, um, ethnic studies, I think we're, we need to have a conversation about epistemology and who has access to epistemology um, and who has the right to know. Um, we're talking, we're coming at it from, um, we live in a white supremacist power structure and we're talking about knowledge for our people um, and we are not white people. So I think the problem in the conversation about talking about um, owning and all of this is that we're coming at it from a place of looking at it within a white supremacist um, frame, framework. And I think that's the problem. Um, we can't reclaim something that already belongs to us, but what we can do is cultivate it. So when we're having this conversation about owning, um, no, we own the right to our knowledge. Um, so I think what we need to do, like she was saying, is we need to, we need to respect the people who are teaching us, and the people that are teaching us need to respect the students, and we need to respect our access and work for our access to learn about our people and our struggles. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, and I'm glad you guys added that. Um, those. Those are actually some of the things that I was hoping might come out, so I'm glad that that ended up happening organically and we, and, and we shifted the conversation a little bit more. Um, and if anyone wants to comment as we go through the next questions to anything that was said, um, please do so. But let's try to move on um, to the next question here. And it kind of speaks to this whole thing about knowledge um, and who owns it, or not owns it, but who produces and um, that we produce our own, right? Um, so this question is, um, each of you um, have worked on issues related to power, knowledge, and community self-determination. The data center believes that research justice is intrinsically about power and knowledge creation. Currently, power is produced mainly by mainstream types of knowledge. In the data center vision of research justice, we see power and knowledge as being produced more equally as experiential knowledge, as spiritual and cultural. 
Keeping that in mind, that, or keeping in mind that spiritual, cultural, and experiential knowledge are all forms of power, how can the field of ethnic studies recenter itself as a part of the community? How can ethnic studies change the material conditions of people's lives through meaningful research grounded in justice? Yeah. And then I have it here if someone wants to read it too. Anyone want to start? This is the second one. You want to restart? Okay. Um, how to recenter, um, what was it? Recenter community? Mm -hmm. Recenter community? Well, I think that, um, in, I, I think it actually requires more than um, any methodological decision that we as researchers, because I know the subject of research justice, um, may or may not take. And, 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 part, and part of what I mean by that is we have to realize, well, how did community become, become decentered? I mean, there's a history there, you know, and it, it wasn't an intellectual argument. It was a political struggle. So I'll talk about the one that I know, the, 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 the specific place I know most, and which is um, the Thurwell strikes, both at Berkeley and at San Francisco State. The first thing they did after the strike um, was eliminate the, prof the, the radical professors. That's the first thing they did. They eliminated the founders. That's the first thing they did. The second thing they did is they eliminated the community boards. Community boards? What the heck are community boards? Well, the founders, many of the founders, because community was perceived as being central and that the type of scholarship and the type of teaching that was to happen was to, was to be intimately and organically connected to the community, the community should be on campus and the community should have a say in who's hired, who's fired, what classes are determined, things of that nature. Um, and the community would be right there holding folks accountable. Not just the university accountable, but the professors accountable, who oftentimes some of the professors didn't necessarily like that. Um, community boards were gone. Uh, third, promote an alternative model. This is where organizations like the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation began actually pumping money into ethnic studies programs that were very much more traditional in an academic sense. You had to have a PhD, you had to have, in order to get tenure, in order to do your job, you had to have a book published, all of those types of things. Community work, if you worked in prisons, if you worked with the farm workers, if you worked around housing rights, if you worked with youth, that's not as significant as, what's the saying, uh, uh, publish or perish, right? Yeah. Publish or perish. Um, and then last, and perhaps most importantly, destroy the very memory of this alternative model that existed, that is this, this radical model. Um, so I think the way you recenter the community is pretty simple. You make meaningful, not as individuals, but collectively in ethnic studies, we need to make a meaningful, substantive effort to bring community uh, into the conversation, into, in, into dialogue, um, reinstituting the community boards. Uh, uh, one, one last thing, just as a, as a um, Again, as an, as an example, the National Association for Chicano and Chicana Studies um, is like the National Association of Ethnic Studies or the Asian American Studies Association. Every year, an academic conference is held. Professors, grad students who hope to perhaps one day become a professor go and they deliver papers and, you know, we all hope to get our articles published and so on and so forth. Um, very traditional academic framework, right? Well, Knox, at least, and that's the way it is now, in the early days, they, and they still have it, but it's, it, 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 it doesn't function in this capacity. They, there was the national, Knox, and then there were FOCOS. And if, for those of you who are Latin Americanists, you know that FOCOS draw from the Cuban Revolution and the thinking of Che Guevara and how do you start revolutions, uh, guerrillas in, in, um, in the Sierra Maestra or in, in, um, up in the mountains. But, Knox was organized where there was the Northern California FOCO, the Southern California FOCO, the Arizona FOCO. And what's so powerful about that idea is that right now, basically, those FOCOs, they don't really exist that much. Um, but what if we had ethnic studies or Chicano studies where the focus was not on the conference, where you have to fly and stay in a hotel, which is hopefully union, um, in order, right? But what if, what if where ethnic studies took place was in church, churches, in union halls, in community centers? 
where those of us who quote unquote do traditional ethnic studies, that is rooted in the academy, are actually in dialogue with union members, with grandmothers, with community members, youth uh, from high schools. Uh, it's a different model, but that takes, again, it's not intellectual, per, I mean it is intellectual, but fundamentally this is a political choice that we can make, that we have to make. And I'll even go so far as to say that if we don't make that decision, if we don't, again, as Cabral says, return to the source, that ethnic studies um, is, 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 um, is in, in, in dire need of, of, of help. Can I just do one thing? Just in merging this, because I see another question here that might also help with this, and I'm going to merge them for time reasons, right? Because um, one of the other questions was in your own work, because I think this adds to it, in your own work, how have you seen knowledge used to create power um, and change? Um, and so uh, if you all want to, you know, speak to that, I think that. I got that one, I got that one later. Yeah, speak to that, yeah. the question that, okay, good. Uh, well, I actually wanted to bring the conversation back to the issue raised by um, the young woman who is a senior at Mills. Uh, what's your name? Jenna, okay. And she talked about the importance of epistemologies. And, um, and I'm, you know, I wonder whether, as a field, ethnic studies has ever seriously grappled with this issue, given that it has tended to be under the rubric of the social sciences or the humanities. And, and I think that um, a, a conversation about um, radical interdisciplinarity uh, should really be placed on the agenda. And an interdisciplinarity that's not simply about traditional academic disciplines. Because we assume that if we add, say, history and sociology and philosophy, then we're doing interdisciplinary work. <laughs> but I'm talking about a broader interdisciplinarity that acknowledges that, that, knowledge, that knowledge is produced in venues other than the university. And I think this was the original, this was, this, this was um, the, the, the original assumption um, underlying the creation of, of, of this institution that, that of course we would use knowledge that gets produced in the traditional, you know, professionalized sites like universities, but we would interrupt a lot of that knowledge with knowledge that gets produced at the workplace, knowledge that gets produced in the course of building social movements. Uh, and that I think is still very much on the agenda, a kind of radical interdisciplinarity. And it also means that within the field, we have to think about um, different kinds of citational uh, practices. Because see, we, 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 we do this academic work and we fall right into the conventional ways in which it's done. Mm -hmm. And you cannot figure out how to cite something that gets produced you know, in the course of like a demonstration or... <laughs> so what you do, you know, so what you do is you cite the academic who somehow or another ended up with that idea even though the idea got produced, the knowledge got produced elsewhere. So how do we, you know, as long as we do that, we will always be beholden uh, to uh, the various modes of oppression that are, um, are inherent in these institutions. As Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. <laughs> Yeah, the, the question also includes a, a spirituality and cultural reference to uh, how we uh, carry ourselves. 
in, uh, I think that ethnic studies falls short on uh, helping us build up our self-empowerment of the things that we already know, we already carry, we already do. And it's hard to give us like credit <laughs> in those ways of knowing things. Uh, in, um, and I think of the, uh, the Indian student, the, the tribal student, who, ha who comes from a very spiritual cultural background and is trying to fit into this educational academic setting and the instructor believes that they're going to teach them about being an Indian, mm. you know, about how you should be <laughs> and what your people went through when we're still going through it, you know. We are the history. Yeah. <laughs> and for, for the tribal student, our spirituality is totally overlooked. It cannot fit into any of the um, processes in this academic setting. And we have to always adjust. We have to always um, uh, adopt what they might be saying to us, what it might mean. And then we have to go home and we have to argue with our elders to say, the school says this about us and our history, where we're going from here. But as Angela says too, is that um, the messages of how we have power, how we do things, may come from a spiritual teaching or a spiritual message that comes down from the mountain or comes from the spring or comes to our ancestors that makes us stand up to a changing environment. Right now, you know, unrecognized tribes in the state of California are beginning to answer that call about the injustices. But our ethnic studies classes talking about the racism and the um, human rights issues or the civil rights issues of being a people who is unrecognized by this very uh, state and how does that re reflect on our educational opportunities or other opportunities. Yet we are a people who carry our songs and have our dances and do our language, and we don't need a university to teach us that. Thank you. Um, I think I probably will provide a little context for this question too, but uh, let me ask it first, and that's, uh, the event tonight is Research Justice Decolonizing, um, um, decolonizing um, knowledge building power. And if research justice is ultimately about a relationship of solidarity, um, reciprocity, responsibility, and shared knowledge construction, the question is, should ethnic studies focus more on transformative research or reformative research? And what I mean by this, um, just to give you an example, um, or even just movement building, right? When we think about it, it seems like it's an easy question, and I think about things that in, in the past, uh, I've been talking about this, I was um, in San Rafael Dominican University, they were honoring Melba Beals, um, one of the Little Rock Nine earlier this week, and I was speaking, we were talking about the legacy of civil rights, and um, looking back, I mean, yes, there have been a lot of progress, but we've also seen, just in the last year, all these sort of attacks on Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, um, but also, I think about Brown versus Board of Education and, and the desegregation of schools, the integration of schools. Was that a transformative act, or was it actually just a reformative act that we've seen actually the conditions are the same as they were previously or worse um, in terms of um, public school education? And so was that reform, or was it transformation? And so I, my question to you all is, should ethnic studies and, that, and the research, that legacy of the third world um, strike, should it be focused more on transformative research or reformative research? Trans they want you all to, they said start with the, they said girl, I think they mean woman, but oh, yes. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a tough question for us, you know, as far as um, that kind of, um, space in academic setting because one, 
you know, you were talking about integration of, of schooling. You know, we're, we're from a boarding school, a forced boarding school institute that tried to strip us from everything that was Indian, to take your language away, take your songs away, take your um, connection to your land, the connection to your tribe away from you. And so we were not in the public school system for many, many years. And then when we did enter the public school system, we didn't know where we belonged. Like my, uh, my mother-in-law said that she, uh, she was in Louisiana at the time, in the 60s, and she would get on the bus and she would sit in the back with, with everybody else that was of color. But she didn't really know because it would say, um, you know, blacks drink here, uh, or fountains here, or you can use this restaurant. But there wasn't anything for Indian people. It's like, so you're gonna have to take your chances on how light your skin is, right? <laughs> Which one you should be in. Because um, there was an ownership to both issues on those things. For, for her, that's what she was saying, is that they didn't know where to be. There was no signs of where to be. And when we entered the school systems in the 70s, you know, when they came out with the EOP programs, and they made some exceptions, but they didn't create any uh, spaces that you could uh, really be educated, that you could really fit in. And so the, the reformed education systems, I don't think they really uh, focused on our, our populations because we're a very small population, you know, we're 1% of California. And in, in any school, we're not anything in that situation, right? We're from very, uh, at the time, very poor backgrounds. Um, so our, and our cultural barriers were different than other people's. Like, if you think of California, especially the California Indians, you know, we only have the experience from 1850. We don't go back to the 1500s or the 1400s of, of having that. And we're also dealing with a new food system, a new uh, way of thinking, a new, new way of moving around and, and having jobs. We're, we're straight off the river. You know, our people went off the river in 1940s. And so that was my mom. I'm first generation public school. And so we don't have that kind of history you know, of maneuvering in the system. And so um, we're still figuring that out. You know, we're still figuring where do we fit? But we do know that the reflection of school systems, colleges, reproduce the value system of the people in charge. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, uh, okay. Um, Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, um, I don't know. I think maybe we need reforms that are radically transformative. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, but let me say something um, substantive. I, I've been, as you pointed out, I've been doing work around uh, prison issues, anti-prison issues for a long time, and and so. And when I was thinking about this panel, I began to wonder why it has been so difficult to persuade ethnic studies programs, departments, schools, colleges to incorporate um, um, a mode of education that, is, that involves uh, people in prison. I mean, it seems to me that every ethnic studies program in this country should have a prison education program. <laughs> and, and one that is not designed as a kind of uh, missionary project, <laughs> right? But one that creates an egalitarian um, relationship uh, uh, between the, the students in the university, the faculty in the university, and uh, the, the students in the prison who are sometimes uh, uh, um, more uh, learned than the faculty on the outside. Uh, so, 
And, and, and right now, uh, in a number of universities, they're trying to do prison education programs, NYU and, and, and Columbia on the, on, on the East Coast. And they're also doing something that I think ethnic studies um, program should take on, and that is to remove the box from student applications that ask whether you've ever been convicted of a crime. So these would be reforms, but they have the potential of having um, a radical implications. So reforms that are radically transformative. <laughs> All right, now I have to check. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm going to ask just one more question, actually, because um, we're um, a little short on time. Um, but I do want to just throw this out in case someone wants to answer either one of these questions. So I think I will because I uh, bring up both of these, and because one of them I think is important. Um, one of them is about changing the institutional culture of universities and communities to fulfill the original purpose of ethnic studies, which I believe was a mission of liberation and revolutionary change at um, local and national levels. So how do we, one question would be, you know, to think about, if you want to address this, I'm going to throw out both, um, and you can choose which one. Um, how do we change the institutional culture of universities um, and the communities that we work with then to really fulfill that original purpose? Because I think as um, the panel has indicated, right, ethnic studies isn't just in the university, it's out in the community. That's where its origin is, that's where it came from. So also, how is it working out in the community as well, so not just ne necessarily in the university? Um, so if someone wants to address that. But the, the final question I really wanted us to focus on is, is, is this, and that's, if ethnic studies were considered a ceremony instead of an academic discipline, how would the mission and practice of ethnic studies change? Let me see, I don't mind if Jason speaks. So. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think they didn't realize that. Mentor, his postdoc. Mentor. Yes. I'm happy to have them proceed. Yeah, I think they didn't realize. They thought I was just giving him the mic. They actually wanted him to talk first. <laughs> do you want? Do you like to answer that question? I don't have to be part of it. Now no one wants to answer. Uh, let me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do the ceremony. I was hoping. You the ceremony. Um, I think that you know we don't do enough ceremony. We don't celebrate our own uh, way of life that was given to us. We have, been, you know, too many people are confused about where they're going, what they're going to be doing. And even newcomers to this country, they give up um, their ethnicity to be here and to be naturalized and start acting like those white people. Why do they do that? You know, we should celebrate ourselves because nobody else is going to celebrate who you are and where you're from and your family. It's like we have to take that on and we have to make that important. And when we make that important, we find that generosity in our heart to include other people and not be afraid of them. I mean, half of the problem with the prisons is that people are afraid of them, but we don't know their history. We don't know what happened. We don't even know if that was the right or a true conviction of what happened. But yet we have been trained to be afraid of this. And instead of looking at ourselves, you know, when we go out into our community or in our tribal village right now, we're not afraid. You know, we have created uh, a space that we trust each other. And that's, where do we, where have we lost the trusting each other? Where have we lost the respect for each other? You know, and when our communities develop into that, we become single households. We, we become afraid of our neighbors. We become afraid of somebody coming up the street. And now we have neighborhoods across America that are in that condition. But if ethnic studies were a ceremony, and if we had that option within an academic setting, 
we would have the funding for this to be able to bring in and welcome and to um, acknowledge each other's existence, each other's history, and to help, like my Graham says all the time, we are here to empower, empower each other, empower our kids to do things greater than we have done, to do things in a good way that needs to be done, and to be here with the environment. Too many of ethnic people are now acting like the takers, and they're ignoring the water systems, the mountains, everybody becomes a taker for money. And instead of um, a person or a part of this environment that we live with the salmon, we live with the birds, we live with the deer, we shouldn't be afraid of the wolves, but we're taught somewhere along the line to be afraid of all these things and that we are greater than all these things and that we can live without all these things because we have trains and buses and airplanes and that you know we have Manzano food so we don't really need real food you know <laughs> but I don't think that's part of uh, celebrating uh, who we are and acknowledging and teaching each other you know, and that's what I say about immigrants coming in, and especially um, the Asian people who come in with different ideas, and they don't know how to be here. And so they impact a lot of the traditional Indian territories on fisheries, on crayfish, on birds, on this. And we need to be sitting at the table with them and to help them to say, you know, this is how we view this. And if you're going to be here, then we need to help you understand how to be here. That we don't take all the fish, we don't take all the birds, we don't do, do those things here because those are our, our relatives and we can't live here without them. Mm. And so, but we don't have that opportunity. You know, we're set up as enemies right off because they're coming in, they're invading, and we don't have a mechanism. And this ethnic studies place could be that mechanism if we're celebrating this space we're in and this land that we're on and the way that things work here from creator uh, about all of our environment and not just you know look at money-making things. The way that I think, you know, I don't know what, colleges are teaching <laughs> and it seems like everybody wants to get rich and everybody's willing to do anything to get that money. They're willing to poison the water and work in a bottle, wa bottle water plant and poison the water. They're willing to work in fracking, you know, no matter what. And, and now we have ethnic people who are lawyers against us. Right, and I look, and we have the white lawyers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not so simple, is it, Colleen? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons we have to be constantly vigilant uh, regarding the concepts that we use because they don't often match what it is you know we're trying to grasp uh, and so well when I saw the theme of the conference ethnic studies as a as a ceremony um, uh, I I spent some time thinking about what that could possibly mean uh, and, and what I came up with was, um, well, first of all, it would um, de-individualize uh, the, 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 the whole process of intellectual production. Um, these institutions teach us first and foremost that if we want to be scholars, if we want to be intellectuals, then we have to imagine ourselves as individuals uh, with no connections, uh, really. Uh, so ethnic studies as ceremony would be about bringing our whole selves, uh, about bringing our, our communities, our culture, our moral concerns, uh, which we're always told to 
leave outside of the classroom, our political commitments, uh, which we are told uh, will mess with the objectivity of the knowledge that is produced. Uh, so, um, it, yeah, it, 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 it seems to me that it would be a much more holistic notion of what it means um, to, to, to know uh, our communities and our worlds and ourselves. Uh, and um, I think that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> In, in, thinking about, in thinking about this particular question, I, I really had a hard time because, um, you know, ceremony, I, I, I tend to, I'll be honest, I tend to not think of ethnic studies as ceremony and I don't want to force a definition that's, that's, that's not there, you know. I mean, it, it also, to be honest, it comes from, um, a, you know, a, a different types of, a different tradition than, than I came out of. So, so I, I want to be careful to not appropriate concepts that I'm not entirely familiar with, you know, I, which I think sometimes we even do in, we do a lot in academia and even sometimes in ethnic studies. But what I understand ceremony involves is, 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 is it's communal and it, it is a he it pays attention to healing and to dealing with collective pain individual and collective pain uh, and so as I thought about it you know I, 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 as you can probably tell I'm kind of coming back to a uh, theme again and again and again and all of the different questions that have been posed about the importance of of linking those of us who happen to have a day job in a, a neoliberal university, right, with our communities outside that space. Um, and perhaps even more specifically to those social movements from our communities that are attempting to not just study, but also transform their realities. And so when I think of ethnic studies as ceremony, I think about it also about naming those pains. I mean, we do this oftentimes in school, right? In, in the classroom where we were able to read and we're able to have conversations and, and dialogue and over the course of 15 plus weeks, uh, um, do all of those things that organizers do. Build relationships, develop trust, dialogue, um, and hopefully, uh, lead to a greater level of empowerment. Um, some of those pains, some of those wounds are externally inflicted, some of them are, are internally uh, maintained. And I, and I think that, again, the real power of ethnic studies, a decolonized ethnic studies, is a return to, and I don't mean return as in, like, like, like some people say, let's redo the 60s. You know, let's, let's do like they did in 68 and take over, take over the campus. I, I don't mean replicate, but I mean go back to certain principles that under, undergirded the founding, and that is to recognize that social movements in our communities, um, oh, my bad, um, are, are, are these spaces of, of knowledge and, tra and transformation. I, I just want to share one quote from... Um, Raul Zebeci from Latin America, a political theorist and, and a radical, who wrote something that I think really explains what I wanted to get across in this regard. He says, if, edu if education is life itself, or that life should be an act of education, this means recovering life in its integral character, overcoming division and fragmentation. And if what educates is life itself, then the educational act must affirm, empower, expand, and set in movement the knowledge that already exists in popular sectors' daily life. And I think that that speaks directly to what I think ceremony can be. Thank you. Um, just having a mic thing here. I think it's okay now. Is that... No? Do we need a... Uh, gotcha, you were telling me to take that one. <laughs> the 
This plate is 6WL6774. Ah, yeah. I think someone's going. Okay, and then uh, I think the mic's on. So right before I'm, folks are leaving and they're gonna give you, the, the reason I asked for a few more minutes, I wanted to just see if, at, just before we close here, is to ask um, each of you what advice you would give. And originally I wrote young people, but you know, I thought about that and I said, Anybody, right? Because we so get so caught in that pattern of saying who needs advice, right? We all need advice. I need advice. In fact, I always say most of the stuff I, I, I learn the most from now is actually from students. And my students have been every age. They've been, and I have noticed this. I'm glad you brought up the question about prisons in that box because I have noticed that at San Francisco State that we've changed so much that there's not students. I used to have students who had, you know, been uh, incarcerated. I don't see those students anymore. I had students who had been in recovery. They're, they're, you know, we've shifted so much to, to, to completely shut all, so many people out. Um, and so this just last question here is, um, what advice would you give people who are looking to to heal what we call it, you know, soul wounds um, that, that exist in our communities, who are looking to bridge the gap between ethnic studies in the, uni in the university setting and then ethnic studies in the community space. So what advice would you, you know, give people who are looking to, um, who just want to see a more just world, right? And to do that, that work of, of, of social change. So any advice you have? I think the, um, the advice that I would give and, and what we're working on now, because we are that history for the future. We are the ones who are going to remember what our lands looked like before the trees were all cut, before the water was all taken, before the mountains were all taken off, um, before our, our waters were polluted. And what, what uh, we're working on right now with uh, our, our groups is, is that we want to bring together the women because the women are in, in traditional culture here are the foundation for our communities. They're the foundation for our children and for our elders, for the span of what we live like. And we want to ask ourselves that question, and I think it's appropriate for all the communities to ask, is where will we be in 25 years? What will we look like? What will we be passing on? Will we still have kids who want to wear these basket hats? Will we still have kids, um, people who will go and sing to the water? And how will we make sure that that happens if we don't do it with intent? And so other people need to ask yourselves too. It's like, what are your communities going to look like? If we don't trust what's in our community now, what will it look like in 25 years? And how are we going to take responsibility to change it to the good? Because that's, that's what I'm asking Indian women right now, is that because we, are, we produce the population, we bring the children into the world, we raise them until they're so old, and then we watch them all the time. All of the people that are of, uh, what we call procurers, meaning able-bodied people able to help both the young and the old survive and comfort those who are coming through hard times. What are we going to be in 25 years? Will we still have those singers? Will we have those dancers? Will we have um, our connection to Mother Earth? And more people need that connection to Mother Earth. We can't sit and uh, be like, I don't want to know all that's what's happening with the water because nothing can live without the water. Nothing will be here. And every community, every water user must make those choices of how you're going to have that relationship and not just be buying, you know, it's like, I always think that the corporate world, they're buying this drought. They're gonna buy their way out of a drought. How do you do that? At the expense of everybody else. And we don't have to change. And so I think that, you know, um, we have to take a personal responsibility, each and every one of us, to what we're going to be and how we're going to be and how we're going to relate to each other to protect our Mother Earth. Otherwise, 
we'll be like fleas on a dog and she'll scratch us off and that's then they'll start over <laughs> This is, this is the, what is your advice question? <laughs> um, I, I think, I think as, as Kayleen just said, I mean, I think it's imperative to get involved. I mean, it's as, it's as, it's as simple as, as, as that, um, whether it be the struggle for, for the land, for water, whether it be the work that groups like Causa Justa is doing here in black and brown communities for housing justice, whether it's the brave brothers and sisters who are, fighting uh, the deportations and the uh, draconian immigration laws that exist in this country, whether it be those struggling in the belly of the beast in the prison industrial complex, I mean, it's, it's quite simply to get involved. Um, and ideas will emerge out of struggle. Fresh ideas will emerge out of struggle. In terms of how to, I think, um, I mean, originally the question was, what, what, when he shared it with us uh, the other day, was what, what would you say to youth? But I think it's the same. To, to nurture within all of us um, a compassion and a combination, this con perhaps contradictory, but very healthy combination of imagination, audacity, and humility. Well, both of you have uh, given such uh, important advice. What can I possibly say? Um, let's see. I think I think maybe I want to say two things. And the and and the first is wherever you are, build community. Um, and you know, we if 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 we assent to the whole neoliberal notion that we are primarily individuals, then we're doomed to fail. There is no way that we can move forward. And the other thing I would say is um, think about how to produce knowledge that is going to make a difference in the world. And it can be done in so many ways. Uh, there's not one way to do this. And don't assume that in order to make a difference, you know, you have to be the stereotypical activist. Uh, some people aren't cut out to do that work. Uh, you know, some, some people just really love doing their research. Uh, and you can find a way to make a difference. Uh, and I would also say recognize the interconnectedness of, 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 of all of the issues. You know, we talk about intersectionality. I think sometimes we talk about it too much. Uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it becomes a way of not really having to substantively address what it means to think issues of race and gender and class and sexuality and ability and, and nation and, and all of these other issues together. Uh, if, we just, if we say intersectionality, then that absolves us of the responsibility of actually <laughs> doing the work. Uh, uh, so my advice is to do the work. You know, do the work in creative, innovative ways. Uh, yes, that's it. Yeah, I, I agree that we all have to do the work. And along that lines, I just wanted to add that, you know, this, this day and age, we think we're in, we have rights, right? We're a rights society. We have laws and we have rights, and if we don't get those rights met, we sue, or we make those things. But we are not responsible. We're not responsible for the end results, and that's what we have to become. We have to become the responsible society. When a spring drives up, we're responsible, and we have to, to make the changes. 
We are ready to make the changes, just like when we were raising our kids. We're responsible if he runs out in the road that we have to make the changes so that they don't do that. And so we got to put some of those rights down and we have to become more responsible for the things that are going on in our community. Responsible for the things that people do and say. We have this notion that when they reach 18, they're on their own, you know, and they are adults and we don't, we don't uh, tell them what to do anymore. And that means we're not responsible for them anymore. But in our society, it's like we're responsible from, from birth to death. No matter how old they get, they're going to listen to me. <laughs> thank you. Um, please, uh, please thank um, uh, Colleen and, and Jason and Angela, please, one more time. What a fabulous, fabulous job. Yeah. Yes. And I'd uh, like to invite Irene Vernon and Ron Scapp, the treasurer and uh, board president uh, from National Association for Ethnic Studies. They have a presentation. Thank you. And, uh, uh, this has been a really interesting night. And I know now that I have the mic, oh my goodness. But I do have a couple of things to say. And it has to do about thanks, thank yous. And it has to do about ethnic studies. and. Um, I have been in ethnic studies since 19, the early, uh, mid-1970s. And so to talk about it, um, this, is, this is what I've been thinking through the evening. Um, so the, the question was, what is ethnic, ethnic studies? Whoa. And I, I have the answer some way in my mind about what is ethnic studies. We are ethnic studies. You, me, our neighbors, our community. And Ethnic studies will only change if we change. Ethnic studies will only transform if we transform it ourselves. So there is a, a sense of responsibility and obligation for each and every one of us to make it what we want it to be. I think that there has been some rooted sense of what ethnic studies is. And, and so those core principles, I think we need to decide how are we going to work in this world of ethnic studies to make it the way that we want to see it because it is us it is it is us and so anyway there's my little speech for the day that's what ethnic studies is it's us um so nace has been uh, giving out an award for 25 years and the charles irby award has been given to people who have really dedicated their life to working in certain areas of, of justice and community and really giving your all to really thinking about what equity looks like in the world. And tonight, I'm really, really honored to really thank and in some ways honor um, Angela Davis for her life, yeah, you. <laughs> for your dedication, justice, prison rights, human rights. But I want to give a special shout out because my daughter, who couldn't be here today, said, she radicalized me, mom. I wish I was there. And so for all of the, the inspiration to particularly um, the communities and everybody but women of color, you have been inspirational. So, Ron. So we honor you, we thank you, and Ron Staff is the president of NAES, and thank you. And I also want to thank you all, too, for being here today. Thank you. Are you guys taking a picture? I think they're taking a picture, I don't know. Um, I'd like to invite Melinda Miko to come up. And if you want Thank you. Um, it's my wonderful, wonderful job to hand out thank yous uh, to everyone. And 
Um, being on the planning committee for this conference has been creating community. And we've demonstrated to our students and everyone around what community means. And they've stepped up to the plate in wondrous ways. So I want to thank um, NAAS first, uh, Ron Scab, Irene Vernon, Ravi Perry, Connie Jacobs, David Galan, Susan Asai, Craig Cook, the NAAS staff who's been here and really jet lagged. So that's um, Ashley, Allison, and Brittany. <laughs> We've done wonderful work. The Data Center, uh, Miho Kim, Jay Donahue, Bill Hogan. And also the um, wonderful staff at the church um, to have this beautiful space. Thank you so much. Um, and the artwork that was produced by Dig Dignidad Rebeldi. I, I knew I would mess that up, but. <laughs> Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza. Thank them for this artwork. We're so appreciative. And of course, the Mills community, I cannot, shall not. <laughs> to my colleagues and staff in ethnic studies, particularly Jean Wong, the goddess of ethnic studies. <laughs> the student planning committee. Wonderful. They never said, what can I do? We just said, go, and they went. So we appreciate that, and they'll continue tomorrow to do this. And of course, um, the provost office at Mills College, um, who gave generous donations and funds so we could fund this. <laughs> but lastly, I also want to thank um, Ohlone people. This is not my territory. This is not my space. I'm a Seminole from Oklahoma. So I'm on, I'm on borrowed land. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Kayleen, for letting me be part of this. And also for, for everyone out there, all of you who came to support us and continue to support us, Mado. Hello, everyone. My name is Katherine Chapel. I'm a student at Mills College and I'm honored to present the Asma Hanlu Safe Ichisan Kai USA Kinuko Matotake uh, Okinawan Dance Academy. The dance I will pre- Um, the dance they will be performing is the Tanchame, and this is a pair dance and one of the most popular Okinawan dance. It depicts an everyday scene in the life of villagers in the small fishing community. Tancha is the west coast of central Okinawa Island. The pair dancers, a young man and woman, wear short banana fiber, kimono, and are barefoot. The man holds an oar while the woman dances with a basket of the type to use for carrying fish. This melody reminds Okinawan people of the blue ocean and the rhythm of waves.
What we do at the end of our Okinawan events, we play what's called katsashi, which means to mix it up. Um, just mix it up. You can usually we dance. We put our hands in the air as much as we dare, like that. And uh, thanks for sticking around. We have a surprise for you. It's a uh, um, a lion. It's the Okinawan lion lion dance. And if it bites you, it's good luck. So yeah. And you get if you want to put money in the mouth, that's even better luck. But. <laughs> okay, so Kachashi. And so our um, lovely dancers are going to uh, give you an example. So just dance like you there. <laughs> Machi 
Sa tumi no na yo mi ayasen soro. 